Our next speaker, uh, Katerina Borchert, is the uh, Chief Innovation Officer at uh, Mozilla, another open source uh, organization that uh, has done an incredible job of keeping the web open uh, and keeping innovation coming. So I'm very excited to introduce you. Please welcome Katerina. Thank you for coming. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is such a pleasure being here. Um, I'm Katharina Borchert. I'm a recent immigrant from Germany and the media industry, where I spent almost two decades developing or building digital news products and um, reader communities. And uh, I am actually very grateful that my culture shock is minimal compared to Dan Lyons' culture shock when coming to Silicon Valley. Um, because while we at Mozilla do have a ball pit, which led my mother to stop bragging about my career, because by German standards, once you have a ball pit, you're not a serious professional anymore. We do not have cheers for peers. Instead, we have really, really angry discussions in the kitchen, whether using Slack over IRC leads you to lose all of your open source credentials, which has recently happened to me. Um, I've been involved with Mozilla for quite a while and uh, joined, their, joined their board in 2014 and finally made the jump at the beginning of last year. As um, Chief Innovation Officer, my, my scope or my mandate is really um, to think about how we invest and uh, work with open methods and open innovation and a really crucial part of my work is ensuring the health of the Mozilla community and the growth of the old Mozilla, overall Mozilla community. And that's why I was really excited when um, Jim in his keynote on Monday uh, stressed the importance of diversity because diverse communities usually make for stronger communities. And when he announced yesterday that um, you would make public all of your learning materials, and I'm really interested and I'm really excited about using that. I'm not putting up this picture to make most of us feel really, really old. I actually have a point with this, because I believe to understand um, the culture we live and we work in nowadays, we need to look back to the very beginning. Um, and 20, 25 years ago, if you wanted to join the open source movement, if you wanted to join the fight against um, big software, you needed access. And that meant access to hardware, access to the internet. Um, access to enough spare time to be able to contribute, and, and access to resources for travel. And that kind of access was usually only available to um, a particular subgroup um, of the population. And it was this particular subgroup um, that was rather homogenous that built the culture, the, the patterns, uh, the kind of communication we still see um, to this day. I think the you and you merit study, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to throw a little bit of data at you throughout my talk and quote a lot of studies. Um, the study that I think some of you had a hand in writing called this the social and cultural arrangement of open source. And it also identified that um, the kind of behavioral patterns were hostile towards women, even though that was often unintentionally so. Um, the culture that developed um, adopted meritocracy as an organizational principle, which in theory makes a lot of sense. It sounds very reasonable, and it's not only open source. Silicon Valley loves meritocracy. Um, but nowadays, we know that while meritocracy um, works really, really well um, for men, it's not evenly applied. There's a MIT study from 2010 that found that women do not reap the same rewards in a meritocratic organization. And there's a study from 2009 from the Anita Bork Institute that pretty much found the same thing is true for underrepresented minorities. And I'm sure that um, most of you will have uh, seen the study that came out last year of the North Carolina State University together with GitHub that, that actually, you know, looked at how our um, contributions accepted, and it found that contributions by women are accepted above average as long as they're not identifiable as women. Once it's obvious um, that you're a woman, it is far less likely that your contribution is accepted. And the difference between that is 10%. I hate to say it, but that is huge. 
Um, and if we look at the, if we look at the numbers, um, uh, we know that 90% um, of uh, applications and systems developers either are either white or Asian, and in the overall industry, they're 19% uh, women. Don't get me wrong, the industry that I come from, the media industry, at least in Europe, this, these are outrageously great numbers compared to where we stand in the media industry. And for over a decade, I was always the only woman in the room, and I probably own more pantsuits than Hillary Clinton. So this, to me, looks really, really great. And when we look at the numbers from the FLOS 2013 study, um, it found that there are um, about 11% women who actively contribute to open source communities. And that is actually great progress because the same study in 2002 found only 1% women. So in many ways, there's a really great trajectory. But I think we still have to realize that there is an underlying systemic problem because um, we still have many of the conditions that led to these monocultures, and um, we still face many of the similar problems. Underrepresented minorities still have less access. It's much harder um, for them to contribute. And I'm not saying this um, to make a normative argument. I don't want to um, be on the moral high ground. This actually matters. And it matters to our bottom lines, and it matters um, to the work we do and the work that we really care about. There's a study um, from McKinsey from 2014 that looked at the composition of leadership team in, across different industries. And it found, it found that if you have um, gender diversity in your leadership team, um, you have financial returns that are on average 15% higher than your industry median. And it found that if you have ethnic diversity in your different levels of leadership team, uh, that advantage even increases. Now, while it is fairly easy um, to measure financial returns, it is much harder to find good measures for innovation. And I know um, that innovation is, like, has been a buzzword for years. And when I talk about innovation, I um, don't, we don't sit around in the ball pit. I don't talk about lofty ideas. This is really, um, as many others have said, this is about identifying real problems and solving real problems. And why I'm probably the last person to advocate for patents as a really good innovation index, there's yet another really interesting study from last year that looked that I think is an interesting, interesting um, indicator at least. And it looked at the adoption of the Employer Non-Discrimination Act across US states. And it found that those states that had adopted the Non-Discrimination Act had 8% more patents and an increase of 11% in patent filings. Um, I have also learned a lot from the work that my successor on the uh, Mozilla board um, did. That's Kareem Lakhani. He's a professor at Harvard Business School, and he has dedicated his entire career to researching open innovation and open source communities. And some of the things he found um, are really, really obvious because most of us have experienced them. Like um, Open source is really, really good at taking big problems, breaking them down into small tasks, which in turn al allows a much larger, um, a large, larger pool of potential contributors to join. But he has also identified some things that, that we're not really good at. And the main thing is we're, we're still not very good at avoiding groupthink and avoiding monocultures by bringing very different disciplines to the table. But this is really, really important in the problem-solving process. And I think the UNU Merit study um, found something similar and, and stated that the open source culture tends to value code over software and engineering over product. And that leads to undervaluing other roles that are also really important in the work that we do and that you need to have at the table if you do want to build really good products. And you know that's researchers, UX designers, marketers, all the people that you do need if you really, really want to reach your customers. And this, this actually has impact on our work. This is super important, but I think it also, um, and it's not only important um, for 
attracting new pools, new different kinds of people into our communities. It is also really important for the second part of the equation uh, that we don't often separate enough. It's really important for ongoing retention and engagement um, of contributors and employees because we often tend to look um, at, at the top of the funnel. How can we attract more diverse people? How do we get these people into our communities? How do we welcome them? And then we forget to look at the other side, we also have to create a culture that retains them, that keeps them engaged. Because if we only look at the top of the funnel, the numbers aren't going to change, and whatever we do is not going to have the same impact. So um, I want to briefly talk about what we have learned and what we're trying to do. And I'm not even going to pretend that we have a silver bullet or that we're so much smarter. I just wanted to briefly outline um, the things that we're doing and I will stop quoting studies. So one of the most important things um, that we do, I think, is learning from others. And I was reminded of this again when I joined the Women in Open Source meeting on Monday night where this was a really big topic. Um, in my experience, we're not even very good in our own organizations at learning from each other, um, at adopting best practices. I see us reinventing the wheel over and over again, but it is even harder across organizations. But I think this is really, really fundamental to our, uh, our success. It is fundamental to, and that's even harder, to also share our failures because I have usually learned way more from the dramatic failures in my life than the great successes. And it's, it's really important but to, to share the lighthouses, to share the best practices, and to celebrate together. So one of the things uh, we have done at Mozilla, for example, is um, join the outreachy program that most of you will be familiar with that tries to lower the barrier of entry through um, paid internships, for example. Another thing that we're currently doing is we had a large diversity and inclusion effort last year, um, took all different kinds of internal measures focused on employees, and we're now currently trying to figure out how can we take the many learnings from that and apply that to our communities. Because somebody said communities don't have HR departments, and that is very true, but I think we can take some of the learnings from our HR departments and also apply them to our communities. The other thing that is really crucial and that is really important to me is um, designing with designing intentionally. It is so hard to fix problems that have manifested over time in established communities, and we, we clearly need to do that, and we need to address the issues we have, but we, it, it, we can avoid so much of, of the problems if we are very intentional about our values, our principles up front. Um, and I think there, there are projects that demonstrate this really, really well um, by making um, shared and inclusive values very explicit by having a code of conduct um, and by actually living that code of conduct. I think a lot of it comes down to modeling the kind of behavior you want to see in your community um, and have, that, have the people that build these communities actually model that kind of behavior. And so I think a, um, a code of conduct, um, I, a diversity statement, um, clearly shared values really, really help. And, and I think we have great examples of that um, in the industry. Ubuntu is a really good example of this. Um, or Mozilla's Rust project, which has a really welcoming, um, thriving, successful community. And last but not least, um, be creative. Try different things. Um, that is one of my favorite parts of my work. And I just want to give you a few examples of what we, uh, of what we are doing. And one is um, Sarah Sharp's FOSS Heartbeat project that Mozilla is sponsoring. And Sarah looks at the correlation between sentiment in a community and um, the contributor life cycle, the engagement, the retention part of things. And one of the projects she looked at is, again, the aforementioned Rust community. And um, she found that Rust has a great thing that that I really, really like, and it's called the High Five Bot. And it's a bot that welcomes new contributors, and it's a bot that assigns reviewers and gives shout outs. And while this might sound really, really trivial, she actually found that um, getting a shout out by, um, 
by the high five bot increases your likelihood of having your code merged by almost 12%. It's a small tweak, but it actually has significant impact. And so I really like, and I actually love what we're learning um, through this project. Another thing I want to mention is another Mozilla project um, that uh, Mozilla is leading together with the Knight Foundation, um, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. And um, it addresses uh, the reader communities on news sites, which, is, um, which actually is an important part of the news business. It's not just a hunting ground for trolls. It's actually, if you do it right, it's an important part of your business. And while this might sound like a very narrow um, slice, I think what we have learned here, um, a lot of what we have learned here is applicable across online communities, whether it's political activist communities or open source communities. And the Coral Project um, does not only do this lovely cards against community, it also builds um, software, it builds survey tools, um, community moderation and community analytics tools. But what I found really insightful is the way they approached this when they kicked off the project two years ago because they took a lot of time actually researching both sides of the equation. The, the needs and demands of newsrooms, they interviewed over 150 newsrooms in 30 countries, but they also took great care at trying to understand what are the expectations and the desires and the problems of, of those commenting there. And so they surveyed over 12,000 commenters. And one of the one of the things they found that is probably not very um, surprising is that men and women have wildly different expectations as to online discourse. And the satisfaction of um, readers in those communities varies wildly depending on the quality of the community moderation. But the one thing that astonished me, because there's been a long debate in the industry around anonymity, and if we do away with anonymity, everybody will become incredibly civilized. And that's actually not the case. One of the things they found is if you take away anonymity and implement some kind of real name policy, the hostility, the toxicity gets even worse. In no small part because women underrepresented minorities now become easily identifiable and many of the unconscious biases that are at play become very obvious here. So I, all, um, I just invite you to take a look at that. It's a, it's a really great team with impressive work. And last but not least, I wanna mention our Equal Rating Innovation Challenge, which sounds way more complicated than it actually is. Um, this is the way we try to address or tackle the question of how do we bring the next billion people online? And how do we do that in a way that actually gives them access to the whole breadth and beautiful mess of the open web, and not just to a small, pre-selected, zero-rated slice of the internet like other companies do. This really um, goes hand in hand with our work on, on net neutrality. And when I joined at the beginning of last year, um, I, because I knew this was um, a big focus and important to Mozilla, I stuck a whole bunch of the smartest people I could find in the organization into one room, and not just like, super smart developers, user researchers, UX designers. I'm like, yeah, I've, you know, I've never worked with as many great and smart people. We should be able to solve that. But it became pretty apparent that it's not only quite presumptuous, it's also really hard fixing problems from the confines of your cozy Mountain View office that affect communities in rural India or Rwanda or Guatemala. Because um, in that room, I was the only person that had ever traveled to Africa. And no matter how much research you do, your perspective will always be very different. So we made this an open challenge. And we tried to uh, reach out to a very global community and um, connect it with, with technologists, with entrepreneurs on the ground that really intimately knew um, that really intimately knew the issues on the ground um, and the complexity of that. And we were quite overwhelmed with the response because when you run such a global challenge, I didn't really know what to expect. And we got um, almost 100 proposals or submissions from 27 different countries. And the quality of the proposals and the quality of the teams participating was astounding. Um, 
but one of the, the best things about this is that it really um, allowed us to connect to very, very different people that we weren't connected to. Um, hopefully allows us to build um, a long-term sustainable community um, with these people, with people that care about the open web, um, that care about bringing the next billion people online. And one of the things that I have learned through this is, it's, it's quite obvious, but it's different when you experience it. The next generation of people coming online and potentially willing, even eager to engage with us, to contribute to our work, they're not going to look like us. They're not going to talk like us. And they're going to have different expectations. And if we want to future-proof our communities, if we want to future-proof our work and everything that we really care about, we need to engage those people. We need to understand those people. And we need to be able to open up our communities and embrace those people. Thank you very much. So if, like, let, let me just quickly say, if you forget all the statistics, that's uh, perfectly OK. If you um, just remember like three things, um, try creative things and actually have fun doing it. I think fun is such a crucial part of your work and not in the Silicon Valley beanbag way. Um, be really, really intentional about how you uh, design things. Um, how you design communities, how you set up communication, and please share your learnings, and please start by reaching out to me either here in person or online in any form. Thank you so much. <clears throat>